world today will be here at the Slave Theater on Women's History Month. And we certainly want you to come out to honor our queens uh, during that particular month uh, at the Slave Theater. And so now we are extremely fortunate uh, to have a giant among giants and then to have a growing giant who is studying at the feet of the tallest tree in the forest. We certainly thank Dr. Charles Finch today who came to us a few weeks ago and electrified us with a tremendous presentation. But we are most honored that he would come back this evening to speak to us briefly and then to introduce a man that we all admire and certainly a man who has given him great inspiration and that's Dr. John Henry Clark. At this particular time, we want everybody to rise on their feet and let's give Dr. Charles Finch, and then Dr. John Henry Clark, a rousing ovation. Dr. Charles Finch, round of applause. Dr. Charles Finch, all the way from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. He has already been properly introduced, and the next voice that you will hear over these microphones is my good friend and great brother, Dr. Charles Finch. It is uh, always a relief to come home. All right. Now, that might sound like an odd thing to say, but home is where the spirit is. All right. And as I get older, <clears throat> I seem to be more and more preoccupied with the spirit that is Africa. Because I like to say that Africa is not just a geographical expression. Africa is not just a people. Africa is not just a state of mind, oh, it is all those things. Africa is our animating spirit, and it's indeed the animating spirit of the world. Even the continents were born from Africa. All right. Humanity, of course, itself was a child of Africa. Right. What we call civilization is just one of Africa's latest products. Mm. All right. And I think, I think that our collective task is the rebuilding of that civilization because the civilization can never be the product or the image of one man or woman, no matter how blessed with genius they may be. Right. Civilization can only be the result of the collective spirit of a people. Right. In fact, I, four or five years ago, I even had someone said, you know, they knew that I was a physician, they knew that I had spent a lot of time r reading and writing about African science. Uh, the empirical foundations of African scholarship, African intellect. And they noticed, they said, but Dr. Finch, you seem to be more and more preoccupied with spiritual matters than I ever knew you to be. And I says, well, yes, you are very perceptive. Absolutely, because you see, that is where it begins and ends for all of us. That indeed, to the extent that people of African descent have a major problem, it is indeed a spiritual problem. And until that spiritual problem is taken care of, anything, we, anything else we do is futile. Now, one of the consequences, you might say, of my first, by, but by no means last, sojourn here among you in November was that we began to discuss, in some sense, the other dimensions that engulf, of the universe. What we call modern physics only recognizes four dimensions. Length, width, height, and time. 
But modern physics is now coming up against a brick wall, a brick wall of their own making, because they are finding that to get beyond those four dimensions, and by the way, those four dimensions are limited by the physical constant we know as light speed, but to get beyond them, there is only one way to go, and that is through consciousness, because the fifth dimension is consciousness or mind. And that with consciousness or mind, you encompass all the other four dimensions and you transcend light speed. And it is therefore possible, really, as African adepts have known for time immemorial and have practiced for time immemorial, to in fact be two places at once. Mm. Right. To indeed to see eternity in a second and the universe in a grain of sand through the medium of the mind, through the medium of the conscious, literally to go to the farthest ends of the universe. And there are those who do that who encompass the universe, because if, we, if the universe is in fact mind, it is accessible to mind. And we find in ancient Kemet that what? The universe comes into being through the agency of the mind of the creator, who gives the creative word out of that mind, and his name is Jehudi or Thoth. The Dogon say that the universe is a thought in the mind of Amma, the creator. So we see that even in the profoundest of African philosophies, this idea that the universe is mind is at the very heart of their thinking. So modern physics is a late comer to an essential truth that African adepts and sages have known from the beginning of humanity itself. And the word is there for anybody to see, read, hear, and understand. So in a sense, modern physics has, chasing it, has been chasing its tail. It was always there, always at our fingertips. In the universe we know as the mind, or as Ivan Van Sertima yes, would say, as another way of looking at this issue, is that what happened 10 minutes ago or 10,000 years ago occupies the same space in this domain we call the mind. That means there are African adepts who can get to a place of timelessness, who can indeed move in more than one direction of time. And finally, physics has recognized that time moves in both directions. That, you, that time does not move in a single direction, which we call the arrow of time. So it is possible with these innate God-giving abilities that were honed to their highest refinement by the ancient adepts and the traditional adepts, some of whom are still existing today, to transcend time. To, as I like to say, predict the past and remember the future. Because Modern physics is also coming finally to the ancient African idea that, in some sense, the future impacts the present, and the present impacts the past. What the past is, is determined by what is happening right now, actually. So time doesn't move in a single length like this. It moves in what? A circle. Because everything moves in circles. And again, all you have to do is read the, the, the thought and philosophy of ancient Kemet and the Dogon to understand this basic truism. These are the kinds of issues and questions that have been occupying my time and my attention. I have, as I have indicated to some, been adopted by two groups of traditional healers in Senegal. Slowly but surely, they are vetting me. You know what that means? That they are testing me. They don't just, just because they adopted me, they just don't give it up, you know. Just because I'm a nice fella, maybe. Just because I have a nice smile, maybe. I am watched, observed, and tested. Not over hours, days, or weeks, but over years. And only at such time am I given a little tidbit and then only just enough to find out the rest of it for myself because the only true education is self-education. Yeah. 
Your teachers and sages and spirit guides are not supposed to hand it to you and force feed it to you like a child getting pablum or milk from a bottle. They are merely supposed to stimulate you so that you can go and find it for yourself because then what you learn, what you acquire descends from the, from the brain consciousness to the heart consciousness. And when it is there, it is possible to transform yourself into a god. One of these, and this idea of God consciousness, of God presence that exists in all of us, the divine spark, again, is an ancient idea that is hoary with age in the African frame of things. So this is why, in order for me to embark on new levels of the past, I, I, I have to go to Africa to do that. At least I find that that's the way it, it happens for me. Just being on that soil, just being there, just soaking it up. And I don't ask questions. You will never hear me ask a question in Africa. That is not the way you get information. And, that is, and it is Africa and Africa alone that I have learned what patience really means. Because with patience, time becomes not only your ally, time, work becomes your servant. You have to know how to wait. It is not a passive waiting. It is an expectant waiting, an active waiting, a positive waiting, a positive patience, so that when the window of opportunity opens, you walk right through it and transform your life. Africa taught me that. So there is something that is ennobling, something that is transformational just being on African soil just absorbing those energies. My adopted mother, Mom Fatusek, 93 years old, a healer for 70 years, has performed 15,000 healings without one single failure. When I met her in 1986 in my own house, interestingly enough, not in Senegal, it was the first time I had ever felt the power of someone's aura. As I tell people, careful about coming into Mom Fatou Sex presence because there are no secrets from her. You do not even have to open your mouth. You can keep yourself as closed off as you think you are and she can read you like a book. This is the power and presence of ancient Africa living through her. The problem is she is 93. Her mind is as clear as crystal glass, is as limpid as a pristine pool, is as sharp as a diamond, but her body is frail. We are told that this may be her last calendar year on earth before she is called home. But what is her last will and testament? She has charged me as her adopted son with the responsibility of bringing her and all of her priestesses, drummers, ritualists, interpreters for a healing ceremony, eight-day healing ceremony on U.S. soil in St. Helena Island in South Carolina, August 11th through 18th, 19th. We all know about African-derived religions here. Santeria, Condomble, Vodou, Shango Baptist, even Root Doctoring. But this will be the first time in the entire history of the Americas that an authentic, active, current, living African healing ceremony will be brought intact to the United States for the specific purpose of establishing the African spiritual presence here so that Africa's lost children will have direct access to the spiritual powers that will lead them into the new age. It is open to the public. We have a group of Native Americans who are coming to pay homage to Mom Sek to this. Because they, they see that the new, they see that they see the new age a coming. And this will be the first, this will be, the, this will be her fourth visit to the United States and most likely her last. Open to the public, free of charge. The only thing required is yourself and your spirit. Not only for her, for yourself, but for those yet to come. 
Penn Center, St. Helena Island, South Carolina, August 11th through 19th. Please see Minister Clemson Brown for details. Please see uh, Mr. Bill Jones, First World Alliance for details. Yvonne Milliner for details. In African tradition, the most sacred of individuals are the newborn and the elderly. Why? Because they are closest to the ancestors and by definition are the wisest among us. We cannot make any headway without the guidance and the wisdom and the experience of our elders. We are here because they came before us. I first met Dr. John Henry Clark in 1982 in Raleigh, North Carolina. He defined the word erudition for me. You know what erudition means? It just means limitless knowledge. I don't think I had ever then or since met a man who knew so much. But I have met people who have accumulated facts and information. What set Professor John Henry Clark apart was the sharp, decisive, penetrating analysis, interpretations, explanations he gave for historical phenomena, quite like, unlike anybody I've ever known before or since. He is an institution. He is an icon. He is an elder. He is a living ancestor. His wisdom, his experience, his knowledge, his intellect is the fire that warms us. If he were in Africa, he would almost be worshipped because the ancestors speak through him and he speaks for them to us. My mother, who is 81 years old, has always told her children, don't give me my flowers when I'm dead. There's nothing that I can do with it. You give me everything that is coming to me while I'm living. And this is what we do. Is, is that not true? We take our cultural heroes and we do not give them their proper due, their, 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 the love that they, that they have earned until they have passed on. It's all backwards. If we are going if we are going to engage, and you know, I'm going to give you these numbers, a 500-year process of reconstruction because brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, and children, sons and daughters, that's what it's going to take. And be ready for the task. Be ready to work for something that you will not see the fruit of until after your life has passed. And therefore, you can continue the work of John Henry Clark. You have a responsibility for continuing the work of John Henry Clark. You will be held accountable if you do not continue the work and build on the legacy of John Henry Clark. So, he is among us now. Let us touch him. Let us listen. Let us absorb. Let us be transformed by his sacred words. Professor John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark. Okay, all right, all right. Dr. John Henry Clark. Let's give it up in a loud voice. We can do it. Dr. John Henry Clark. He could have been anywhere tonight, but he chose to be with us. Dr. John Henry Clark. We love you, Dr. Clark. We love you, Dr. John. Henry Clark.
the next voice that you will hear will be the eminent Dr. John Henry Clark. I'm at the podium. Go ahead. Go ahead. You take a stick that far? Yeah, uh -huh. I appreciate being here, and I wish I had a cheerful message. But we are at the crossroads of our existence as a people, and we have never been in more danger than we're in right now. <coughs> we're in danger because we have not understood a basic thing, the structure of the community and the family. And we have dwelled among and catered to and worshiped foreigners, fakers, and fools. And we have forgotten our own sense of the family and the community. We're meeting at a time when we are memorializing the 31st year of the passing of Malcolm X and we still did not understand him and did not really meet him. Because if we understood what he was about, you would understand what that charade in Africa and Asia is about. If you have read a newspaper here published here in Brooklyn called The Liberator, that article, that appraisal of that needless journey and a waste of our money is appraised. It is very often, very seldom, that I read an article and agree with every word of it. If you want to know what I think, read the article. I will devote no time to this masquerade tonight, this massive waste of time and money this great international show that will lead you no place except to another collection play and make the players richer while they look down their nose at you. Now, our sense of community was lost when we came in touch with people who had no sense of community because they did not come out of a community comparable in its organization that we did. And we lost that community when we began to imitate them. We lost a concept of the community as nation. Something called nation is a container it's a container for your aspirations, a container for your hopes, a container for your past, an influence on your present, and a prophecy to your future. And when you lose this container called nation, you lose the frame of mind that goes into the making of a nation. And once you understand nation, nation is portable. You can take it wherever you go. Now, if you understand the Italians, is on the face of the earth, he will answer to the word Italian. Your great mistake is you should not only lost the concept of nation, you've lost the nation frame of mind. You open a store in Chinatown, you wouldn't get one customer. Then, 
why are aliens running the store in your neighborhood? And if you ask to run the stores in your neighborhood, you are called racist. Why are you called racist for doing for yourself what everybody else have had the common sense to do for themselves? <laughs> this is where you have misunderstood the concept of nation because the concept of nations is the concept of responsibility. Now what kind of nation did your enemies come out of? All the years when they had not emerged from the ice, had not built a nation at all, and now with all of the attack on African people, and they're bringing now pseudo black white people, dark skinned Caucasian. Oh, the Egyptian was in Africa, all right, but, but he's a dark skinned Caucasian. The Ethiopians was in Africa, but then he's a dark skinned Caucasian. Why have both blacks and whites neglected? the vast body of literature, of radical literature that white people wrote about the danger of white people on this earth. We don't want to destroy any people. That's not part of our culture to destroy people. We have dwelled among the people of the world and if you read all the information on Africans in Asia, Africans in America, how is it that we had the common humanity to dwell among the people of the world, to scatter ourselves through our curiosity throughout the world, and there is not one hint of a wall between us and the people that we visited. We have already proved that we can maintain an African nation and participate in a universal nation. To time, to, the time to call for this is the time that we need to remember Malcolm X because we are still misinterpreting him. We are still missing his, na his mission. And we're still missing his call for the restructure of the African nation throughout the world. He went beyond pan-Africanism to a holistic approach for African people throughout the world. He did not call for you to dismantle your society, but he called for you to deal with the people who destroyed the society and your sense of nation. I have written a book called Who Betrayed the African World Revolution in Other Speeches. There have been so much betrayal since I wrote the book, and so many betray us. Now I must do, write the book all over again. <laughs> I must make a deeper assessment of the civil rights movement when we, dip, when we began to dismantle the institutions in the black community and run toward everything white. When we got into the NACP syndrome in that bag of worms called integration that we should have never asked for. Had we asked for desegregation and justice, we could integrate on our own terms or not integrate at all. You do not integrate institutions that hold you together culturally and spiritually. You can welcome people into your institutions, but you do not change the rules to suit them. So we are not talking about what other people are already doing. One of the main reasons why they guard their institutions because they fear the security of their institutions and yet they tell you to be like me.
is to be civilized when he is not civil. <laughs> the relationship of the European to the non-European world is a protracted act of aggression. Then why then there are so many of us brainwashed to the point where we think that to rise to respectability in the world is to be like them. When you look at their attack on our institutions, our frame of mind, our concept of the family, our language, our clothes, our tradition, is that they fear these traditions that they have observed because we built nations that had no word for jail because no one had ever gone to one. We never heard of the word sociology. Sociology was invented to take care of defects in their society. <laughs> a jail was invented to take care of a defect in their society, a jail. And because that society was so out of kilter with reason, people got lost in their society. Now, right now, there is a custom in the South where we never use the word adoption. We use the word taken in. A child, no parents, no, you know, family and mother died, father. Somebody take him in. And I know this because I was one of the taken in children. <laughs> Couldn't get along with my stepmother. My father didn't do much about it, though he tried. I was working and mowing lawns and cleaning dogs and washing cars and a cook at one of the houses I work in said, if you ever, without a home, you just come and live with me. Never forget, Miss Rosa Lee. So I was taken in. It was a honorable house, then came the depression. Had to be another kind of house that we don't mention in respectable company. <laughs> <laughs> But the ladies in the house, in their feeling toward me, in their feeling toward themselves, in their hope for themselves, they had not given up. Although they had to violate their humanity to stay on the earth, they had not given up. That they would, from their own earnings, would buy me a set of encyclopedias. People in the neighborhood would come to me to get the lessons, and me to look up things. I was always reading almanacs. Most of when the white folks throw away the almanacs, I would pick up the almanacs and, and memorize things. So all my information was a year old, but people didn't know that. <laughs> so the gamblers would take me around. I bet you this boy can name me all the shit many ships in the Japanese Navy. And a little, another little boy would open, and I could do it, and they'd win their bets. I'm going all over town, and they'd, they'd explode the hell out of me. I didn't think about this until 20 years later. <laughs> but I'm loved and respected for my fine memory, and bet you I can name all the capitals in the United States starting backward. I began to train my mind by packing my mind with insignificant information. I can name the second name of the first wife of Clark Gable. Now what the hell does that mean to you? You're kidding this out. Now what I'm trying to get to, that we came out of a structure 
for the mind was respected because I could read, teach Sunday school before I was 10. I was a little celebrity in the community. Now what I'm telling you what happened to me, I'm telling you what you still fail to do for young people. I would thread the needles for old ladies, run little errands, and sometime when I'm passing, they cook some gingerbread. You know, when you're, when you're a kid, some hot gingerbread or, or two nice buttered biscuits. <laughs> they just hand it to you. And after the evenings of going around and displaying my knowledge and the gamblers have won 20 or $30 on me, they would take me to Miss Ada's restaurant. So Miss Ada, feed this boy. So what did I get? The house special. Beef stew and rice and beef stew gravy, 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> because Miss Ada loved me and respected me, she was sneaking a little beef and after a while she would bring me some cornbread. What I'm talking about is that we had a common humanity and a community nest. before we encountered people that we wanted to imitate because we thought their toys were better than ours. Their language was better than ours. They began to destroy our sense of community-ness. And this is why I would think it is vile and vulgar to compare a Malcolm X with what is happening now because there is no relationship to the great integrity of Malcolm X than what is happening now. I have seen and witnessed Malcolm X turn down more money than was collected at the Million Man March. Turn it down and walk away from it because he had enough integrity to do so. We need men of integrity now. We need people with enough nerve to refuse something. We need leaders who don't need Mercedes Benz and stretch limousines. For once, the price of one stretch limousine, if you contributed to a black student, he could go through medical school. We have not asked. Leader, where are you leading me? Where are you leading me? We have followed after people without checking them out. This is why I think you need to read this article in a paper called The Liberator, published here in Brooklyn. The article by Pleasant because it contains the best analysis of what is happening that I have seen so far. Now, back to the concept of the community, because people take from their basic community a community frame of mind that goes into the making of that collective container called nation. When an Italian is in Australia, Africa, a thousand miles away from home, when you call his name and he answers, he answers in the name of a nation he took from home. Then, who deprived you of your nation concept and your nation name. Why are you so misguided that you would think that one of the great shows of the 20th century would occur and there would be speaker after speaker, 40 speakers, not one uttered the name 
of your nation, your nation in the world is called Africa. And when you understand that people function from the basis of a nation and they go back to that nation to renew their spirit, their hopes, and to call a meeting of over a million people and nobody, but nobody mentioned the name of Africa. And I said, if you call a meeting with two or more black people anytime in the world and don't mention Africa, you are out of order. Yes, <laughs> There's a book called The Tribes, dealing with the rising power in the world the rise of the overseas Chinese and the rise of the Chinese at home, the rise of the Japanese, the rise of the Jews. Nobody mentions Africa because all of them assume that somebody else, European or Asian, will continue to rule Africa. That is because you do not have a single African head of state with the sense of nation. He has a European mind and an African body, but no African destiny. He is a slave because he could be the head of a nation with no African value. Why is it that Africa needed no civil courts, no Western trained lawyers until the European came and created a need for them? Because the elder in the family was the head of your Supreme Court. In my family, my great grandmother Mary was it. And when she started talking, everybody stopped. And she would tell the same story over and over again. Story about her husband who was sold into slavery to a slave breeding farm in Virginia and how he brave he was and white people had to get rid of him because they wouldn't dare kill him. And the story of her slave men in Georgia and her watching Sherman move to the sea, burning down Atlanta. And we would say, Grandma, you know you didn't see Sherman. I did see it. I saw his eyes, meanest man I ever seen. I had read it coons. <laughs> <laughs> and we would dispute her one more time, and she would take her car pipe out of her mouth, tap her cane on the floor. So I see it. These old eyes see it. So, All right, Grandma. The court has met. You've announced your decision. There is no Reprieve, you saw Sherman march to the sea. <laughs> and yet she was teaching us lessons of survival, teaching us her memory of Africa, her memory of the last African to come over before the fakery of emancipation, <laughs> teaching us truth, teaching us wisdom, teaching us survival into ourselves, we were a miniature nation. And when something happened within that nation, all of us came to the assistance of the person. And the one thing we wanted most, to keep the trouble away from the white folks who don't understand our problem, don't understand our history. Today I heard Malcolm X message to the grassroots again. And most people have heard it, but not understood it. But what he was calling for is to understand the land basis of nation. And so many of us have let our parents lose thousands of acres of land in the South. 
We once owned almost 20 or 30 million acres, and today we own less than 3 million acres. We own the land from which the bread must come. And within ourselves, we are a miniature nation in a black community. I am not an endorser of Jim Crow. I wanted to get rid of it as bad as anyone else. But what I'm saying that, once you get rid of that, you didn't have to get rid of your values. You didn't have to get rid of the black corner store. You didn't have to get rid of the black church. You didn't have to get rid of the black lodge. You didn't have to get rid of the numerous small but clean as a laundry black hotels in the black community. You didn't have to get rid of the sisters who can lay a dish before you to make other people apologize for thinking they can cook. <laughs> because in the civil rights movement, we reached for the wrong things. We thought the thing to be is to be like them. When we had a higher standard of morality than them. Why be like them? Why not set an example and let them be like you? We wanted to be close to them. We wanted our children to sit next to them and soak up education through osmosis. And our children got cut to pieces. Many of our children could ring, run rings around them educationally. Then why did they go to these white students, got dumbed up and confused? We should have given our children strength and confidence when they went to the school. Don't tell me math is hard. We invented it. Well, hell, the pyramids is there. You can't deny they're there. There's no bonding agent. I mean, things were built without cement 6,000 years ago. They're still standing there. They had a paint that's color fast, hadn't been retouched in 3,000 years. Right now, you, you paint a house in 10 years, you got to paint it again. And you can observe all of this without understanding the nature of the war on our community and our community frame of mind. The European came out of a scattered community. It was no community. And he claimed the creation of Rome and Greece. I can show you. I can do more in proving to you that Rome and Greece was not Europe than anybody else can prove that Egypt was not Africa. <laughs> Rome and Greece was not Europe. Two Mediterranean-inspired nations, because when they rose, there was no Europe. That's hard on your imagination. What created Europe? The challenge of Rome and Greece. Fighting Rome and Greece, they got themselves together to fight it or try to destroy it. Getting themselves together to fight this challenge made them a nation. They began to have facsimile nations, and they weren't even clear of the nation concept in Europe until near the end of the 18th and the 19th century. And you, you actually thought, here's the people who came into the world civilized. And Europe was born when the ancient world was ending at the beginning of the modern world. There was no Europe in ancient times. You don't know how to dispute them or turn back all these fakers and these Woman book called Leskowitzka, not out of Africa. Yeah. If not, look, a cat 
will protect its kittens. A snake will bite you if you come near its, its, its young. And we can't protect those things that sustain us as a people as we walk the earth. We can't claim anything that we did. And one of the main reasons we are delinquent in making a claim, we do not understand the concept that someone else projected to the world called civilization. Civilization is mechanization. To organize thuggery is not to civilize a people. Now, when we look at the history of the intelligence of Europe and its war on our community, we can trace European intelligence from the discovery of a book called The Odyssey and the Iliad, written by someone named Homer, who we don't even know whether he's man or woman. <laughs> to this day, they began with a lot of mythology about Africa. Complementary mythology, but strange and confusing. The African was 10 feet tall with one eye in the middle. It's a complementary, but misleading mythology. It began with the Greeks. Anytime they want to get people off their backs, said, no, I'm going to call on my friends, the Ethiopians, but leave me alone. Why did they turn to Africa as a symbol of strength? when they were just beginning to discover intelligence. Now let's look at 850 BC. Egypt had already had 10,000 years walk in the sun. It was tired. 100 years later, Egypt's relatives from the south but move up, Castor, Pianchi, Tahaka, starting in 751 BC. These relatives from the south, from the 25th dynasty, would show the people in the country that the Greeks called Egypt how to rule a nation one more time. Don't count any dynasties after the 25th. Because all the other dynasties was mixed breed, mulatto size, foreign eyes, and confused. Ending with Cleopatra. Where was Europe learning to crawl while the Africans were walking in the south? But the first thing when he beheld your community was to declare war on your community, your own frame of mind. I have, over the years, delivered a lecture called Africa 3,000 Years Under Siege, many times, but not always the same way. For 2,000 years, our enemies came from Western Asia. before the European came. The last invader from Western Asia after the Assyrians, now called Syrians, was from Iran. They were so brutal that the Africans cried out, oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show me some mercy. This invasion from Iran set up Africa for the, the invasion of Alexander the Great. Now, this is 332 B.C. Hear me well. Nothing in Africa had any European influence before 332 B.C. 
if you've got 10,000 years behind you before you even saw a European, then who gave you the idea that he moved from the Ice Age, came all the way into Africa, and built a great civilization, and disappeared when he had not built a shoe for himself or a house with a window? Why are people so good to us before they're good to themselves? Now, if you want to do some good homework on this and want to understand the nature of a fakery called civilization, remember, civilization like Broadway shows have to have a rehearsal stage. Now, if Europe came and built the pyramids and all those temples, then you've got to find the ruins of a rehearsal stage in Europe. Because you would rehearse on how to do it before you finalize it. Just like they take a show and put it on out of town to see if it's good enough for Broadway. If it's not good enough for Broadway, they close it out of town. Broadway's so expensive, you can't even afford it unless you can draw an audience. Now, if you take African history, go to the South, and you will find experimental pyramids, 42 experimental pyramids. You will find the same social thought in the South as in the North. You will understand that the Nile River it stretches 4,000 miles into the physical body of Africa. And the, the main population that people Egypt came from the south, from the rehearsal stage in the south. Now, after the rehearsal, they had a general idea how to build a great structured nation. Then they developed a great agriculture so they can feed a lot of people. Housing complex, a great spirituality that contained a lot of people. And so the greatness of Africa does not belong to Egypt alone. It belonged to a collection of people who came down that great cultural highway called the Nile to build Egypt. And the first thing they built was a structured family a community nest. And when communities couldn't get along, they began to sell the difference between community and the community to make a larger community called a city. Then they consolidate the cities into something called a state. Then when great territories came together, it was equivalent to an empire. All of this opened the way for the first dynasty and the second dynasty, and the third dynasty, with the great commoner, M. Hotel, father medicine, father philosophy, builder of the step pyramids, father of great architecture, a multi-genius. <laughs> now, look at this multi-genius and look at his ancestors, and look at Paul Robeson. Great singer, lawyer, all-American athlete, language. <laughs> now look at it. Now you can understand that Paul Robeson and M Hotel are relatives. Do you know anybody else that produces geniuses of this magnitude with consistency going back thousands of years? Then why must you leave these great values to be whores after the values of a valueless people? The sense of community and the sense of nation is what we have lost in the sense of what Malcolm X was trying to teach us, especially in his message to the grassroots, that land is the basis of nation. Edmund Blyden, in the 
end of the 19th century, his inaugural address at Liberia College. He said, we will have to work for many times, many years to come without the popular support we have to have. We strive to be those things most unlike ourselves. We feed grist into other people's mills. Nothing comes out except what has been put in. That then is our great sorrow. We're knocking at the door of someone else's house and we're neglecting our own house. Now where, where do we go from here System-wise, I maintain that there is no African solution short of a pan-African solution. That there is no capitalist solution unless you are in charge of the capital. There is no socialist solution unless you are in charge of the social. That there is no solution that can be imported to you. But you must work out a solution based on your values. There are certain things we may not need, but had we in the United States understood that with the rise of the civil rights movement, the Montgomery bus boycott, we could have put those best values together rescue the predominantly black colleges, especially those teaching forms of technology, understood not only Booker T. Washington, understood that there was no fight between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. There was a difference of opinion on educational methodology. But they were all walking in the same direction. It was not then or now Booker T. Washington or Du Bois. It's now it is Booker T. Washington and Du Bois. Take each one for what he had to offer and do not start a fight between one and the other. Marcus Garvey was attracted to the United States because of the Booker T. Washington program. He wanted to build a school of that nature in Tuskegee. So there's a length between all of our strivings. But if the black American was in better position than any Africans in the whole of the African world, it is not because he is wiser or stronger than the rest. Once we get this through our skulls and stop competing to our, our, among ourselves about my slave master better than your slave master, if you're against <laughs> If you're against slave masters, then they're no better. If you're against evil, you do not choose the lesser between two evils. Anytime you choose the lesser between two evils, you have compromised with evil. Yes. Now, why did I say that the circumstances of oppression in America has given the black American certain advantages that could be used to rescue the African world because of the nature of the work we had to do, the attitude of our oppressor leaving us with no illusion that we were a part of him, the things we had to learn in order to stay on the earth, we were in a position to rescue Africa. We could, we were the only African people on the earth who Africa, for Africa could get a modern, scientifically trained army. But we had been trained in the basic military techniques essential to the maintenance of a nation, land, air, and sea. We weren't trained to do this for Africa's sake. We were trained to do this for our oppressor's sake. Our oppressor needed us on those ships at those guns, drilling and fighting his de designated enemy. So we gained that skill that we did not transfer to Africa. If we had transferred that skill to Africa, there'd been no coups and counter coups wrecking African nations by a bunch of thugs called an army. We would know that the army is separate and distinct 
from the state, you do not, armies cannot run in a state. Now, if you understand what those thugs have done in Nigeria to destroy what could have been Africa's greatest nation, you would know what I'm talking about. Because they had enough lawyers, they had enough technically trained people, but they did not have a sense of a coordinated community. Nigeria's effectiveness was destroyed by religious fascists and religious thugs. People who take, don't understand spirituality and choose an artificial form called religion, all man-made male chauvinist murder cults, You do not have to engage once you understand that, understand the nature of our society in Africa, where the woman had a designated place while sometimes different from the man, sometimes the same, it was always equal in importance. Right. Now you got to imitate someone whose wife had to fight him for a crust of bread in a cave. <laughs> you want to be like them. When your greatest hope is to be like yourself. Your greatest hope was to look into what kind of society you produce, what kind of spirituality. How is it that you can build entire societies without one trained judge because grandpa is the judge. The elders are the judge. Why can you build a society with no woman beating, no child deserting, no teenage pregnancy. How can you build that whole society? Because you've got a built-in morality in the community that, de that lets you know what is permissible and what is not permissible. Before the event of civil law, what we produce is not what you should do. We produce taboo what you should not do. And once you were clear on what you should not do, you knew what you had to do. You will not desert your family. You will not strike a woman. And you will consult both sides of the family if you had a difference of opinion with your wife. And when you married her, you did not marry just a single human being. You married into a family. And if you dare to lose your sanity and think you're going to raise your hand against her, remember, she's got 100 cousins, 50 <laughs> uncles. And you got the same thing on your side because if you strike her, you have disgraced your family, and your family gonna get on you too. So your hand is not gonna get up before you take it down. Say, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> so we had no domestic court, because the domestic court was the family itself. The help came from the family itself. The sense of arbitration came from within that family. Now, why people succeed where you fail is that even when they move from that historical place of origin, they take the concept of the family with them. A Chinese would look at another Chinese he never met in his life, but if he's in trouble, you're going to come to his assistance. You're going to walk away. <laughs> you see too many brothers in trouble, too many sisters in trouble, you walk away. We have to understand that the wall between the black man and the black woman is not of their creation. They didn't know they had a wall until white sociologists told them they had a wall. 
then they begin to react to a wall of somebody else's making. Now this is why I take offense to the concept that black men must march a million and atone. What am I atoning for? I know a whole lot of black men not delivering, but I know a whole lot that's doing the best they can under circumstances created by their oppressor. And who needs some assistance? At least a pat on the back and say, you've done well. In the South, many black men work two and three jobs to keep their women from working in kitchens of the enemy. Because he worked, she took un undue liberties. And some people were strong enough to fight it off. My own sister said that I'm the last kitchen generation in this family. She trained all four of her children. First place she made sure they got through high school before they slowed down. And when they slowed down, we can have a family conference about which one we can afford to send to college. But you ain't gonna stop being educated until you at least finish high school. And wherever you work, it's not gonna be in somebody's kitchen or more in somebody's lawn. There's nothing wrong with working in people's kitchen. There's nothing wrong with mowing people's lawn. I've done all of it. But when you ha don't have to do it, you're trained to be something better. Why not be something better? This is a sense of community -ness. It is a sense of family. It is a sense of hope. It is a sense of nation. We have to look into all the activity that we are engaged in in relationship to Africa, and some of it negative. I admire Reverend Sullivan, but what Reverend Sullivan is trying to impose on Africa is pan-capitalism and not pan-Africanism. <laughs> I attended the 50th anniversary of the 5th Pan-African Congress met in Manchester, England a few months ago. There were two or three rival meetings of black cop-outs conservatives. <laughs> they think Pan-Africanism is obsolete Multiculturalism now, interracialism. <laughs> yeah, you go, you're going out of business as a people. First and foremost, I claim myself and my kith and kin. I call that the essential selfishness of survival. Taking care of my kith and kin first and foremost. For well, this, you have to begin with a mirror and liking what you see. If that's not a friend staring back at you, you have no friend. Maybe thinking about Malcolm X is the time to say something that emphasizes his integrity, and to ask you to please read some sincere work written about him. Most of the recent books on Malcolm X could have been left unwritten. There's some scattered things in it. In the new book on the Million Man March, and read the mission call pulled together by an utter faker Melina Karenga, who did not, who no more invented Ponzi than he invented the air. He took it from a concept in Tanzania. All this is documented now. He went to jail for mutilating black women. And that's documented. Go, you good lawyers, or pretended lawyers, go look up the court record. It's all there. 
He's got only high, yellow, almost white ones in his harem. And his number one is a Mexican with Afro will, wig. Why are you following this faker? <laughs> Who not only have an ego problem, but a color problem too. Why don't you investigate and ask leaders, where are you leading me? I saw him in Africa. I saw him in Africa. He is disrespectful of African people. In Egypt, he goes into the Holy of Holies, the sacred pray prayer room of the priest with his shoes on. I'm going to tell some of this not gospel. I saw this. He treated other African people with utter contempt. We got to the, uh, the bus going to Memphis. And he says, why? why are we going to Memphis? Nothing there. This tell me how little he knew about Africa. Memphis was one of the world's first metropolis. It was the first city that had a traffic jam. They tore down most of Memphis to build the Gaza Strip and all those areas that before Cairo, which is a modern city, modern Western built city. The great temples of Egypt were not built in what we now know as Cairo, built on the outskirts. The pyramids, you never see a pyramid on level ground. It's on ground tilted toward because they had to get out of the way of the river. It was the African sense of communityness. Now, European interpretation said all this was built by slaves. Slaves are not that skillful. <laughs> you can go right now to some of the temples in Egypt, and between the seams, you can't even put a playing card. It's so tight, there's no cement, and it's balanced, not fell down. Been there thousands of years. Now, a bunch of idiots of Europe who didn't even have a shoe when this was done, was say, we came and built this. And failing to understand that, they said, well, somebody came from the sky, and built the pyramids from the top, with a straight face. Some of you don't dispute that. Now, there's a book called Not Out of Africa, endorsed by some of the black conservatives, written by an Irish woman married to a Jew, who find anti-Semitism all over the place. Have you ever seen anybody give you a clear definition of what is a Semite? You can't be white and a Semite too. You can't be European as a Semite, too. <laughs> anti what? Have you ever seen anybody stand in front of a German and call him an anti Semite? Aha. Uh -huh. Then why do they call you and get away with it? You might think this is off the subject, but it's on the subject because it's on the community. People have been able to destroy your community and yourself and your confidence with the tyranny of words. Words you did not create. You have to understand, you've done some interesting things with the English language, but it is not your mother tongue. You live in a Eurocentric intellectual universe. Even the name of the stars came from them. How do you know it was called a star until they called it a star? They painted a picture in Europe in the 15th century using Michelangelo's relatives as the model. They told you, this is the Christ. 
how do you know? Between the conference at Nicaea and the painting of that picture, there was no figure of Christ. Then suddenly someone paints a picture and you accept the picture and if they take that picture down from your churches, you leave the church. He don't resemble your father. He don't resemble your mother. Then how do you become your Christ? You won't deal with it. All people paint the deity to resemble themselves. I've seen six, six different pictures of Buddha, all with a touch of blackness. Japan, Indonesia, and in China. Why are the Indonesia not arguing with each other over the picture of Buddha? Because they have exercised something you have not exercised, the right to paint the deity in your life to resemble you. My point is, if your spiritual community was imported and other people are in charge of your commercial community and you have neglected your cultural community, you are in essence a slave. If someone else minds your mineral, Markets your gold, cuts your diamond. How dare you lie to me and tell me you are free? You are still a slave. But we could have done, after the civil rights movement, the Caribbean independence movement, the African movement, we could have pulled the talent of the African world together, and Africa would now be a world Power. We would have counted the million, the Africans in Africa, nearly a billion right there. The Africans in Asia, the Africans in India. You put all of those people together, and you've got a billion and a half people. Now, if someone goes into bargain for their unity and their goodwill for a billion dollars, that means that we, he is bargaining for less than one dollar a piece, and we didn't tell him to sell us in the first place. Now, don't get angry, get smart. Think it out. Who authorized anybody to put us on an auction block for sale? Once you understand the nature, the imperial nature of all of the religions of the world, you can pick and choose any one of them, but convert them into what you need them to be. Uh. I am not arguing against religion, I'm arguing against concept. You took a concept created at the Conference of Nicaea when they Europeanized it, and from then on, used it as the handmade European conquest. I'm saying the Islamic faith is not one mite different, except in some cases, it's more brutal. And I'm saying, I'm not saying leave it. I'm saying seize it, take it over, make it what it needs to be, to hell with the corrupted Arabs. You cannot, you must distinguish between Arabism and Islam. You must study the life of Bilal and Zaid bin Harith, the two Ethiopians who helped them and make the faith. You must study Ethiopia who sheltered the members of this faith. And when the trouble blew over, they went back and established it as a faith. You must understand why Bilal, the first of the Mazum, the first to call the faithful to prayer, this Ethiopian who was offered the job as the first caliph of Islam, why he refused it. These Arabs fighting among themselves over the religion, they're still fighting over it, and yet you let them guide you and enslave you 
they're deeper in the slave trade than ever. And the documents are existing. And many of the people in the slave trade, especially the Sudan, are black Africans in the north enslaving their brothers in the south. For the head of the state said recently, I am Arab first and African second. Wherever you are on the face of this earth, your world community is named Africa. You must pull that world community and take it, speaking a single voice, into the arena of world power. You must do this for yourself, for your children, and the still more beautiful ones waiting to be born. Thank you. Dr. John Henry Clark. Woo. The Slave Theater is on fire tonight.